Hello. How's it going? Let's talk about type. Um, fonts are software now. That's awesome. And I want to talk to you about why I think that is. All right. So first of all, as Sound said, uh, I'm Tobias Kunisch. I lead the design for Google Fonts. Um, I've been with Google for a while. I, I joined Google in 2010. Um, and when I got hired, my role at Google was a webmaster. So when you hear that term, you probably think of something like this. Um, the term webmaster was sort of like old school back in the day, even then in 2010. Uh, but it was actually a really cool job because we maintained and designed and programmed all the websites that Google did. Um, not search, but all the marketing websites and everything um, that lived on Google.com. Um, so uh, we were all doing a lot of web design. And when you did web design back in the day, in 2010, you really didn't have that many typefaces at your disposal. There was a group of fonts that were called the WebSafe fonts. Um, and you might have all seen them, right? They're Arial, they're Georgia, Verdana. Um, and that was because um, back then, browsers didn't know how to render a typeface if it wasn't installed on a user's computer. So these were the typefaces that came pre-installed on a Windows machine or on a Macintosh. And they had equivalents on Linux machines. Um, can anyone actually spot there's one font missing from this list that was part of No, it was not Helvetica. <laughs> Comic Sans. It was Comic Sans, everyone's favorite. <laughs> um, so the fact that people could only use um, you know, this small list of WebSafe fonts meant that a lot of the websites on the internet back then looked something like this. This is a screenshot from Craigslist. I actually took that recently. I could do that because they haven't really redesigned since 2010. <laughs> but generally, this is what it looked like, right? Like all, you know, everything was using Arial. Like if you know, web designer got a little bit more adventurous, they used Georgia with serifs. Um, but it looked very same same across the internet. Um, of course, there were ways you could use other typefaces in your design. Like you could, you know, open up Photoshop. That's what people used back then for web design. You could open up Photoshop, you know, uh, use one of their fonts that you had pre-installed and bake them into an image and put that on your server and tell your browser to render that image from the server. However, that was a really bad idea for several reasons. Like for one, if the image didn't load, users would see something like this, which is like the broken image, um, the broken image image for Netscape 4 back then. Um, but it was also bad for other reasons, like assistive technology, like screen readers and other accessibility um, features. They wouldn't be able to read the text and images, right? Like once the text is baked into an image, it's just like pixels of a certain color arranged so that they may, so they are, so they look like text, but they're not real text anymore. Now it's bad for accessibility, and it was also really bad for SEO. So search machines couldn't read what's on your website, and you know you wouldn't come up and search. So around that time in 2010, people had already started using CSS to lay out their, their websites, right? Like people had moved from um, layout tables, you might remember that, the, you know, the people who have been doing this for a while uh, might have encountered, like we, we used to use layout tables for website layouts and spacer gifts to sort of like, you know, you know stretch the tables to the, to the right length and right dimensions. Um, but around 2010, HTML5 and CSS were, CSS3 were introduced. And CSS3 came with this add font face rule, which is known as web fonts, which let uh, web designers uh, take a font file, put that on their server that hosted their, their website, uh, and tell the browser to get that font file and use that to render the font. So we were liberated from you know, having to use that small set of websites, web safe fonts that we had to use prior. However, um, that wasn't as easy as it sounds, because uh, typefaces and font files have to really be uh, made in a certain way to render well on screens. And uh, those web safe fonts that were commissioned by Microsoft back in the day, um, they were made so they, you know, they were optimized for the, for the screen. 
They had font hinting, which is something that's needed for the browser to decide or for the computer to decide uh, where to place the pixels on that grid that makes, your, that makes your display, which was smaller resolutions back in the day. And if it didn't have that, it looked really crappy if you, if you used a font that didn't have font hinting. Um, and also, you know, fonts don't come for free. Like, people were kind of used to fonts being free because they came with their computer. But the, uh, the operating system providers had paid designers to make those fonts and optimize them for the screen. So it wasn't really possible to just like grab you know, a, a font file from your, I don't know, creative agency server and use that in your web design uh, because there was IP attached to it, right? Like designers need to get paid. Uh, designers need to eat, uh, and they should be. Um, so I told you back in 2010, I was hired you know, to the webmaster team at Google. And I was really excited about this you know, web font thing, that, which is like new and exciting at the time. Um, so after I started, I found the internal typography mailing list at Google uh, and wrote an excited email saying, hey, you know, wouldn't it be great if we took some open source font files that are optimized for the web, put them on our data centers, and everyone can just use them? Um, and then, you know, pretty much the same day, I got an email back from two engineers in Mountain View saying, hey, you know, we had the exact same idea and we're working on an API. Come join us and do the UX for this. So that's how I ended up, you know, um, uh, working on the launch for, for the Google font, the Google web font uh, catalog, it was called back in the day, beta, when it launched, as my 20% project. And the, um, the, uh, the opportunity to scale it up to 100% and you know, launch a second version and so on. So that was 13 years ago, right? Like a, a lot has happened since then. And just to paint you a picture, um, that's, a, that's an image of the iPhone 4, which was the phone that people used then in 2013. It was all still like schoolmorphic beauty and you know, it didn't look anything like it looks today. Um, there was no Spotify, like certainly no TikTok. There was no Uber. AirPods hadn't launched, A Apple Watches hadn't launched, Figma was yet to be invented, it was still a few years down the line. Um, so a lot has changed since then, right? And, and everything is awesome now, right? Uh, because, you know, now we have all the technology. Well, almost. A lot of things are awesome, and I want to show you a few things that I consider to be really exciting. So we're going to talk about text and web design, variable fonts, very excited about that, and emoji icons and color. So let's dive into text and web design. I want to show you a few features that have come to Figma recently that are also coming to CSS and will be available in browsers soon, which means you can use them in your design, and developers can also use them you know, so that you know, the implementation, what ships, matches what you have in your design. So one feature I want to call out is vertical trim that was introduced earlier this year to Figma. In this little animation, you see how, uh, you know, where it can be found in the, in the Figma UI. And what ver vertical trim does, uh, take some explaining of how fonts work. So back in the day when fonts were still made out of metal, you know, used in you know, movable type for printing and printing presses, um, every letter was made out of a piece of metal, right? And when uh, type foundries and type designers created that metal, they left some spacing around, like they added some extra spacing. Um, because some of the letters needed like extra diacritical marks or had descenders, um, and they all needed to be the same size. So there was some spacing around it. Also, to create a larger line height in printing, uh, printers used little pieces of lead that they sort of like wedged between the lines of metal type, um, so the line height wasn't increased. Um, that's why it's called leading, because those metal pieces were made of lead. Um, so what vertical trim does, it trims away that extra spacing that's unique to every font, that makes it really hard in design to sort of anticipate how much spacing there will be. And this, in this example, in the um, Add to Basket button, uh, you can tell how there's some extra spacing that sort of like makes the, uh, the label not sit where it's supposed to sit, and vertical trim trims away the extra spacing uh, that sits on top of the capital letters and below the baseline that all the letters sit on. And this is also coming to browsers. Exact same thing. It's called Letting Trim, whereas I think you know, they're about to re rename it again before it gets supported on all the browsers. Uh, but what you see here on the left in this image taken from a great article uh, by Ethan Wang over at Microsoft on the Microsoft Design website, uh, you can see how this extra spacing 
um, around uh, the, the lines of text can mess up uh, your alignment in the design. And vertical trim, you know, it feels like a really little feature, but that makes a big difference when you lay out your, your, your page. Um, it's the, the CSS uh, code is here at the bottom right. Uh, I'm not going to go through it specifically, but where it says cap alphabetic, that's basically to do the same thing, like it cuts it off at the cap height, the capital letter height, uh, and that alphabetic baseline. Um, another thing that I want to tell you about is drop caps. So drop caps are a thing that you, you know, that uh, has existed since the Middle Ages when uh, Christian monks in European medieval monasteries copied uh, religious texts and Bibles. Um, they tended to take the first letter on the page and make that really large and give it a lot of ornamentation um, to make, you know, the text more attractive. Um, and this is still used sometimes in printing and it can still be done in web design, um, but you know it was kind of you know it needed sort of hacky hacky workarounds. And now this is really easy. You can use first letter um, in your CSS um, and just do what you see on the on the top right here on the slide, uh, and tell it to give the initial letter the height of three lines. Uh, and it will just render it that way. So really easy to create something in design now that can be replicated in, in your browser. The last thing I want to show you from this group of new features uh, is balancing text. Uh, and this, again, is a very small feature, uh, but that can make a really big difference. Um, so what's shown here at the top in the screenshot is text how it usually flows, right? Like text you know, flows uh, to the width of your container. And if there's like one spare word at the end, it will just like show that there, you know, all by itself, not being very attractive. So with this new CSS rule called uh, called text wrap balance, you can let the browser balance out those line widths. So what you see at the bottom is an example of that, uh, which is great if you apply it to headings uh, in your in your page design, uh, because then it evens out the the length of the of the heading. Uh, giving it like a more balanced appearance. Um, this works uh, for up to five lines, so I wouldn't recommend it using for long form text and paragraphs, uh, but it's great for headings. All right. So on to variable fonts. Very excited to talk to you about that. So, but before we go to variable fonts, I want to go back in time to 1501 uh, and introduce you to this gentleman. Uh, his name is Aldous Minutius. This is actually not a picture of him. This is how Bing Image Gen AI creation tool imagined Aldous Minutius. Um, he probably wore a hat like that um, because he was a printer in the 16th century in Venice. Um, and this gentleman is known for a bunch of things. Like one of the things is he, you know, he introduced new formats of books that were smaller and easier to produce and made it more accessible for larger um, audiences to, to buy books and read. But he's also known for introducing the first cursive font. So in 1501, he asked his punch cutter, Francesco Griffo, to start working on a font that replicated handwriting more closely. And that you know, became the first cursive font. And when they did that, what they had to do back in 1501 is they had to create another set of metal pieces with those cursive letters. And they didn't only have to do that once, right? They had to do that for every size that they wanted to print the font in. So many different sets of metal uh, of, you know, of little letters that you could then put together in, you know, to print in different sizes. And this concept can still be observed today on our computers, right, on our modern day technology. This is a screenshot of the font book application on my uh, MacBook Pro. Uh, showing the example of Roboto, and here you can tell it's not, you know, it's not just Roboto. It's Roboto regular as a file, and italic, and thin, and thin italic, and all the combinations, and then yet again for Roboto condensed. Same in uh, text editors these days, right? Like with the example of Roboto serif in this case. Um, so again, you see all the different styles there that you can select, and those are all individual font files on your computer. So in 2016, uh, a group uh, of companies came together and decided, you know, there has to be a better way to do text on computers. 
Um, so a group of that comprises of Microsoft, Apple, Adobe, Google, set out to introduce an extension to the OpenType format. The OpenType format and the OpenType standard is basically um, the spec of how, like the, the standard that all computers use to, to handle and to render text these days. Um, and in 2016, they introduced this extension to the standard called font variations, which is also known as variable fonts. And so now with variable fonts, you didn't need a font file for every style that you wanted to use from your font. All the different styles were all packaged up in one font file. So why is that good? Um, here's an example and a comparison between like a traditional static font and a variable font. So these styles, these different styles, were now are now represented by what's called variable axes. Um, at the bottom here, you know, I'm showing the variable uh, weight axis, and the top, like the traditional static equivalent. So you can tell how at the top, you know, the static uh, version just has the thin, the regular, and the black, the same as you would select it, you know, in your in your text editor. Um, whereas at the bottom, in the example with the variable axis for weight. You have all these you know, thin, regular black styles, but also anything in between becomes a spectrum. And you can sort of like address every single weight in between as well and scrub through them and you know, use them to interpolate and create animations. Um, so let me show you a little demo of how that looks like in a browser. Let me switch to the demo. Um, so this is a little uh, demo page that we built together with the material design team and their fantastic engineers, uh, showing you the example of Roboto Serif and how that is rendered in the browser, and how I can use this weight slider to manipulate the weight axes and the, C the according CSS. There's now a new font variation settings uh, rule that lets me set the weight value. Um, for this text. You might have noticed there's also width, and I can use the exact same way. So I can you know, select any width from really condensed to really wide. And because I have both of these available, I can actually select any combination of the two. So I can have a really condensed, very thin Roboto Serif, or you know, any other combination, uh, giving me a lot of flexibility in my topography. The same you can do in Figma. So in Figma, um, there is now a type settings window that I can access with this three dot uh, panel here and the variable tab. And here you'll find those exact same, let me, take, make, let me make this text bigger. All right, here we go, going back to the panel. Here I have the exact same slider that you saw in the browser demo for weight and for width, letting me access the exact same thing. Exciting, right? I think this is awesome. All right, let's go back to the slides. OK. So, you know, it's neat and all, but you know, what's the benefit of this? OK, so let's, let's talk about like, why variable fonts are so awesome, in my opinion. So we generally talk about uh, three different categories of benefits that we get from variable fonts. One is compression, one is text finesse, and one is larger expression. And let's go through those individually. So the, uh, the compression one is really practical and straightforward, right? So remember back when I was showing you how we needed one font file for every different style of your font? That sums up on your computer, right? Like if you use lots of styles in your web design, the browser has to load all these. Um, and with variable fonts, you get all these in one font file. A variable font is usually a little larger than one of those fonts you know, that represent a static uh, style. But you know, if you use two or three or more of those styles, a variable font is generally smaller and, and more performant, you know, leading to like, quicker load times and more performance. So that's a very practical aspect. But let's look at text finesse a little bit. Um, this is where it becomes really neat, in my opinion. So going back to width that I just showed you in the browser, there's neat things that you can do with that. So one practical application is um, justified text, for example. So if you've, 
um, had some education in web design or learned about web design at some point in your career, um, someone will have told you, don't, don't justify text on the web. It's terrible. It never works well. Um, this changes with variable fonts, right? So you could see in this example here how you can just like um, adjust the width of the, of the text slightly so it fits right into the container you want it to be read, making it more readable and more attractive. Another example uh, I'm showing you here in this hypothetical app, um, which is a localization from an English app into German, which is my native language, and tends to have really long words, right? People tend to try out German to see if their layout falls apart, if everything gets really long in localization. So as you see here, right? Um, so if you have a variable font with width, with, uh, width axis, it's really easy to tweak the width of the of this text uh, to make the layout not fall apart and still be usable. Another variable feature, another variable axis that I hadn't told you about yet is grade, and grade is really interesting. So grade is very related to weight, uh, but whereas weight, as shown at the uh, at the example of the button at the top. Um, weight changes uh, the, the uh, horizontal metrics of your text. So if I make a text or a label bolder, it also runs wider. But it's really tricky if you just want to use, um, uh, 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 sorry, a select status or a hover status in a button and make the label bold. Your, your padding gets out of whack, and your spacing gets out of whack, and you have to adjust for that. Great, on the other hand, increases the weight of the stems of the width uh, of the letters as well, but it doesn't change how the text flows. So you can just have that um, hover effect, for example, without messing up your padding. So that can be really useful. It can also be really useful if you have hypertext, like regular, you know, regular links uh, in, uh, in a paragraph, and you want to have a hover effect. Uh, usually that causes you know, text reflow, and you might, you might end up with one more line in the text, and the whole text rejiggers. With Crate, that isn't the, that isn't the case. <clears throat> so another really neat feature that I want to show you is optical sizing. And that requires some explanation, so bear with me. So what you see here is the lowercase a's of one typeface um, as they are created in different sizes, scaled up to, to appear in the same size, so we can compare them. And what you will see here that the A with the 4 on top, which has been designed to be read and printed in a very small size, um, has actually quite a different shape to the one in 72, which is intended to be printed and read in a very large size. It has thicker stems and you know, um, larger counters. Um, so that to our human eye, if it's really small, the shape actually appears to be the same as the large one. And this is something that was done in, you know, in Aldous Manusius' times, because you had to create a different set of metal for each size anyway, so you could just as well optimize for the size it's going to be read in. We lost that when typography, typography moved into digital spaces, because that was really easy, just take the same letter shape and scale it up and down. So variable fonts are bringing that back. And in this example, um, you can see how the same text can look with and without optical size. And you will see that in the example with optical size, the small text is just a little bit more readable because it's you know, optimized for reading, being read in small sizes. And the big, large heading, the high there, uh, is a lot less chunky and a little bit more attractive. Um, this can also be really useful if uh, you design for different viewing systems, uh, distances. So not everything desi we design is you know, to be read you know, on, your, in our, on our phone in, uh, right in front of our face. Um, there are situations where you might be designing something for a TV where you're using really large text that's actually being read from across the room, making it appear much smaller again. So you can use optical size to tweak for that and actually give it a smaller optical size so it's optimized for being read as small text, not as large text. The great news is that um, this is available in all browsers now automatically. So if you use a variable font that has optical size built in, 
browsers will just automatically do that. They will just automatically you know, optimize the shape of your letters, of your text, to the size they're being read in. And this is great for readability and also just to make your, your, uh, your design better. Uh, let's go back to the demo real quick. Um, so I can show you how that looks like in Figma, because that's also available in Figma. Um, so going back to my type settings pan panel and to the variable tab, um, you can see that you now have a checkbox down here um, that has a label that says set optical size automatically. And if I do that, you know, optical size is applied to my text. Uh, if I uncheck that, or if I just use that slider here, I can override that. You know, that's the example of you know, the scenario where I would be designing for a TV, for example, where I'm setting the optical size to smaller than what it would be automatically. Or I just leave it at you know, automatically, like the browser would do, and get text that's optimized to the, to the size it's uh, supposed to be read. OK, going back to the slides. So that's all, that was all about like, making your text render better, right? having better quality text and having higher text finesse. But you know, what's really visually exciting is the expression part. And I want to show you a few new typefaces that have new variable axes that uh, didn't exist previously. So type designers can now basically build any axis that they can think of into their variable font. Uh, and a great example of that is um, a font called Chantal Sons. Um, that we created in collaboration with uh, this artist. Her name is Chantal Martin, uh, and a foundry called Aerotype. Chantal Martin's art is known for her line drawings that incorporate uh, her handwriting. So she worked with Aerotype to create a variable font based on her handwriting that has two new axes. One is called Bounce, and one is called Imperfection. Um, the bounce axis actually makes it so that the baseline for each letter is shifted slightly because you know, no human would write all the letters in the handwriting on the exact same uh, baseline. And the imperfection makes it so that there are slight variations in the letter shapes because you know, equally no human would write each letter the exact same way every time. And this is a very smart application of new type technology to make a handwriting font you know, that we can use on our computer uh, feel a lot more natural like a real person would have written it. Another one that's really cool are the tilt fonts. Um, these fonts were created inspired by neon signs that you would see in like a, you know, a diner, for example, where it says open or close you know, in neon lights. Um, and this is, you know, you can not only see this in the design of the, letters, of the letter shapes themselves, but also uh, with the use of the X and the Y axes there as variable axes, uh, so that, you know, a designer has the ability to, sh to tilt them in three-dimensional space, making it appear that, you know, you're looking at an, an open or closed side from the side, for example. Another one that's really cool, in my opinion, uh, it's called Kablamo by Vectrotype. Um, this one comes with a morph axis, which sort of influences where these little cutouts and extra dots go. Uh, in this example, it's just you know, scrubbing through the axis, changing the, the value of the morph axis to create this animation. So it's the dancing front from outer space. OK, some other stuff that I want to show you. Um, all of this, and you'll notice all the other stuff I'm going to show you are also connected to variable fonts. But if we go back to the demo, I want to show you how all of this can be applied in emoji. So the Noto emoji team, uh, can we switch to the demo, please? Perfect. Um, the Noto emoji team has created a new set of emoji, which are all monochrome, or actually a variable font. So I want to show you this. This can be used just as a font, so I'm changing the size here. And because it's monochrome, it can be much more easily paired with text or in you know, situations where like, a color emoji just doesn't feel appropriate. I can just you know, change the text size here. Let me put this in front of a background here so you can tell. And I can also change the weight because it's a variable font and it has a, a, it has a weight axis. So you know, this is bringing you know, new ways of expression to emoji for your design. 
All right, let's go back to the slides, please. Okay. So this can also be applied to emoji. So you might have, uh, sorry, to icons. You might, have, you might be familiar with the material icon set. And we created a new version of the material icon set we call material symbols, which is also a variable font. So all these features that I showed you about those variable fonts earlier, you will find here weights, grade, optical size. Optical size is really neat with icons because it makes it feel much more appropriate to the size if you scale it up. If you scale it down, it doesn't feel so chunky. This one has an additional one called fill, which basically um, gives it a negative space appearance uh, for something so like select state, for example. What's really nice about this is we created a, um, a plugin for Figma that you can find in Figma communities if you search for material symbols, where you can try all these out, like get the right styling for your design and just use them on your Figma artboard. Another cool thing is color fonts. If you were in the previous talk, you might have already seen this. Um, they had a demo of this as well. Color fonts are a new standard that all the uh, big browser companies um, were part of creating and they're all starting to support. In this case, it's also um, a variable font that has this, an access to create this isometric three-dimensional appearance. But what's interesting about color fonts is that they support gradients. Uh, and color palettes. So they come with color palettes built in. And in your CSS, you can just say, you know, give me color palette one or give me color palette five, depending on your design or whether you're switching between light mode or dark mode. You can also just use CSS to overwrite each of these colors uh, individually and create your own appearance. So I think all of this is pretty awesome. Um, we haven't changed the entire world, but we've made typography quite a bit better in the last 13 years. So. That's right. So, and I think it's awesome also because, you know, as the title of the talk says, I think because we now have these, um, these values that express, you know, the variable settings that you choose, we have a shared language with our developers, right? It's now much easier to tell our developers, like, this text has this weight, like 638 in this example. And it has this grade value. Um, and it uses uh, letting trim, for example, from the early example, right? And you know, this becomes even easier with the you know, developer mode that was introduced yesterday. I'm showing the old version here. Uh, but it gives us a shared knowledge so that you know, the handover process between design and development becomes less lossy, right? We can give developers like, the right values that express our design so they know exactly what to build. Another reason why I think all this is really awesome is because we now have the ability to have text respond to conditions. Um, this could be a viewport size change, or it could be like in this example by the creative agency Collins who did a rebranding for the symphony here in San Francisco, text that responds to music, right? Like their branding is made to look like it's responding to the music by the orchestra, which is really cool. They created a whole new variable font for that. Or, you know, it's just because we can now be really exp expressive and playful with these new features built into, into these variable fonts. This is a website that the Swiss type foundry Grilly built for their font GT Planar. They're known for their for their websites, for their fonts, but this is pretty awesome. And this is just using all the features that they built into this font to be really expressive and make their website look like a space journey. And I recommend you buckle in to ensure pilot safety, you know, when you look at this and when you use all this awesome new typography. All right, that's all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>